basically based on that today, we will talk more about wealth and how to create it. If you want to create wealth, um, the very first thing that you need to do is actually to think wealthy. And what does that actually mean? Thinking wealthy is a paradigm change and it's a change of mind, a change of mindset, according to some people. Um, I read and I was watching a video recently about um, a, a gentleman who said, in order to create wealth, you have to own assets. And so one of the things that he did was that he said, so as I said, you know, last week was very interesting. In last week's episode of Debo's Dead, and if you haven't, please go on YouTube and watch the last episode. We actually talked about the difference between wealth and money or even wealth and riches and it got a lot of feedback and um, we then decided in the research team of Debo's Den to take further looks at what wealth really is and how to actually create wealth. So just a small recap, last week I said there are two different things, there is wealth and there is money and that even though they are used interchangeably they actually mean two different things. So on the one hand, I said that wealth is really like an engine that creates money. And on the other hand, money is a concept or a value or means of exchange. I then went on and talked further as to how, you know, we really should chase wealth and not money. And I mentioned a few other things and all. So please, before I go on, I would ask, please go watch the last episode of Debo's Den, the difference between wealth and money. And so basically based on that today, we will talk more about wealth and how to create it. If you want to create wealth, um, the very first thing that you need to do is actually to think wealthy. And what does that actually mean? Thinking wealthy is a paradigm change and it's a change of mind, a change of mindset, according to some people. Um, I read and I was watching a video recently about um, a, a gentleman who said in order to create wealth, you have to own assets. And so one of the things that he did was that he said else like he was creating wealth for himself because not only is he buying things that he's going to spend money one off and that's it by buying one share in apple or levi's or nike or whatever company it is he has the opportunity to be a co-owner in that company again remember last week's episode where i said if you want to create an engine of wealth it is either you buy shares in companies that are already creating wealth or you create your own company or your own business that is creating wealth or turns into an engine of money. So it's important to note that there are actually no hard and fast rules. Pitch deck development is different from company to company. However, today I'll be using um, as a reference a pitch deck developed by Get Funded Africa in our own fundraising round. So general rules, will I say, yeah, for general rules for pitch deck development. One is that um, there are no rules, okay? So different things go pretty much as long as your story is well told. Now, a pitch deck is usually used by an investor to decide if they want to have additional conversations with the startup. Now, note this, um, many investors, right, out there don't necessarily have the time to sit down and talk to startups. So what do they do? They ask startups to tell their story, literally the pitch deck, and share with them. And then when, you know, they take a look at the pitch deck, they can then decide if this is a company that they want to have additional conversations with. So essentially, because in a pitch deck you're telling your story, one of the things you want to do is to make sure that the slides are not you know, too long. So typically it's going to be a PowerPoint presentation or a PDF document, and that presentation should probably be between 10 and 15 slides long. As I said, there are no rules, but generally speaking, it makes sense to have it long enough to be able to tell your story, but short enough for someone to be able to quickly glance and understand 
what your pitch deck is about. So I think tip one, no rules in creating a pitch deck. Now let's start with the pitch deck itself. So the very first thing using Get Funded Africa's example, as I said, is to state what the problem is. So some people call this the problem statement. Now the problem statement is like the early part, maybe just one slide is enough to really explain what the problem is, how, what is, what, what is it that, you know, the company has seen or you as the founder have seen as an opportunity in the market. What is missing? So in Get Funded Africa, for example, we started off by actually talking about the challenges that startups have. Now remember, Get Funded Africa is a platform that solves the problems that startups face, financing or fundraising being one of them. So we actually started our first slide, as you can see um, on your screen, our first slide talked about the challenges that African startups faced. And so this invariably in pictorial form was our own problem statement. Challenges related to fundraising, challenges related to business know-how, challenges related to mentorship and exposure, challenges related to telling African stories. So this was ours. For some other people, it's usually maybe like a text that summarizes, you know, what those companies see as a problem. And that, my friends, is the problem statement. Hi there. So at this moment, I actually want to address, you know, the next thing that should actually be on your pitch deck. It should be about the market size. Now, in our own pitch deck, when we talked about the market size, we kind of like stated market size in terms of number of startups and in terms of the value of that uh, activity based on the numbers from the World Bank IFC. In your particular case, depending on what it is that you're doing, you want to make sure that in your market size, um, I like to say the, the, the rule of three, right? In the rule of three, essentially, you're saying that you're trying to estimate the total addressable market. That's what's the size of that problem that you have actually stated. How big is that problem that you see? And then there's also then the, um, what I'll call the um, serviceable available market, which essentially is what percentage of that market or what portion of that market can you actually acquire? And then finally, it's now uh, the market that you think realistically you can actually capture based on your business. So basically you want to talk about the market size so that the investor knows that this thing, not only can you do it now, you can actually scale and grow in a whole big way or bigger way that they expect. Remember, the investor is investing not only in your business today, but in your business tomorrow. So you need to make sure that you can show the size of that market in your pitch deck. I'll be talking about something that is probably the most important thing. And I'm not exaggerating. You know, a lot of us live our lives and we want to be comfortable. We want, you know, to be able to buy vehicles, buy houses, buy clothes, buy jewelry, and buy things for our loved ones and all. So all of this requires a medium of exchange. The thing is though, there's actually um, something that people use interchangeably. People interchange money and wealth. In fact, many people think and use it in such a way that it means one and the same thing. Actually, what I want to say today is that money is different from wealth. And I'm actually going to make some recommendations and explain to you why money is different from wealth and which one you actually should chase. Now, here's the thing, and I love saying here's the thing, just so that you can focus. Money is actually a medium of exchange. So something that you can use to trade between one person and the other. That's what money is. And so if you read books like The Advent of Money, 
or the history of money. Some of you probably already know that before money was invented, really, in terms of fiat, i.e. currency or even coins, it was actually barter. So basically, you had, say, 10 tubers of, your, of yams, and then you could exchange your 10 tubers of yam for 10, you know, bunches of bananas or whatever that thing is. And that's what used to happen then. And then you had barter systems. Over time, it became that you could actually use um, a, piece of, a piece of paper or a coin that is backed by, you know, some government or something strong um, to say, or some institution to say that you can exchange, you know, in this case, your tubers of yam, you know, in exchange for that piece of paper or that coin, or you could exchange your bananas for that piece of paper or that coin. And that's when currency actually came to be. But as I said, that's actually money. And there's a difference between money and wealth. So in terms of definitions, and I was just explaining, money is just a means of exchange. That's it. No more, no less. There can be other definitions and all that. And for the economists and co that have standard definitions, um, this is really more about keeping it simple and keeping it real for the people listening to me. And that's money. So the question then becomes, what is wealth? I'm going to use, again, my own simple definition of what wealth is. Wealth is the engine that generates money. Now, note that there are two different things. And this is probably why many people use this interchangeably. Wealth is different from money. Money, on the other hand, means of exchange. Wealth, on the other hand, actually means the engine that generates the money. And so, naturally, advice to anyone listening to, you know, whoever is listening to this episode of Debo's Den. Wealth, money, which one would you take? Answer the quiz and we'll be right back. So, Money can actually buy you a fancy car. Um, money can actually buy you a Range Rover, you know, um, Range Rover 2022 edition. Um, and that is something that money can actually buy. Wealth, on the other hand, can buy you a Range Rover 2022, a Range Rover 3020, 30, 3032 or 2032, um, a Range Rover 2042, a Range Rover 2052, a Range Rover 2062, depending on how long God says that you're going to live on earth or how long you live um, your life. So you notice something just from this very simple definition. Money is something that is actually temporary. It's really about exchange. So it's there or it's gone. Wealth, on the other hand, is the engine that continuously generates money. And this is actually what you should be chasing. So tip one, note one, focus on wealth and not on money. My very first tip on doing business in China or for African startups is um, recognize the demography and the economy that you want to target vis-a-vis -vis your product. Now, one mistake many people make is to think of China, oh, it's 1.4 billion people, it's this very big country, how do I actually even enter it? The reality is that yes, politically, um, and even you know, demography-wise, China is one country. But economically, think of each province as a different country. Now, um, Shanghai, one of the places I lived in, um, had a population of about 25 million people. So just Shanghai alone, that's that, that province, um, had 25 million people. They then had other provinces that had, you know, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million. Remember that 30 million, 40 million, 50 million people is the size of certain countries. 
For example, the UK has a population of about 50, 60 million, which is the same as France and similar population as Germany. The US does have um, 300 million people, but even then it's kind of like split and spliced. Now, why I say this is that in terms of your product, it might be better for you to target maybe one of the provinces, depending on what it is that you sell. So rather than trying to enter China and enter literally through all the popular places, you could actually enter China through one of the quote unquote smaller places, noting that a smaller place could have a population of 50 million. Okay. Um, and oh, let me give you an example. In China, and just this is just something that is very interesting, a stat that I have shared in the past with other people. In China, as at the last count, they had 120 cities with a population of 1 million and above. What this means is that not only can you target your product on a province by province basis, you literally can also target your product on a city by city basis. And the needs of these cities are diverse. And so literally, if you're an African startup, the first tip I would give you is to do your research on what product you sell and what province or city to actually target in China. So that leads me to tip two on doing business in China, which is that make sure you are aware of the legal and operating requirements of your industry and what you're doing. Now, let me state this. Um, I don't know what country you're going to be watching this from, but China does not play with its taxes. So in whatever it is that you're doing, make sure you do your research on the effect of the FAPIAO. So you might hear, hear this word um, several times. FAPIAO is F-A-P-I-A-O. And essentially, it's kind of like um, the withholding tax or VAT system in China on top of all goods and services um, that are traded or, or services purchased in China. Why is this important? Because if um, maybe in the product that you offer, your margin is 10%. And now the third prediction that I have under the celebrity based set of predictions is centered around somebody you all probably know. Yes, I'm talking about Amazon's founder, Jeff Bezos. Now, Jeff Bezos has um, an investment vehicle called Bezos Expeditions. Jeff Bezos actually invested in Africa for the first time in 2021, where his Bezos Expeditions invested in one of the big African startups called Cheaper Cash. Now, Cheaper Cash got investment from um, Bezos Expeditions. And we believe that Jeff Bezos's Bezos Expeditions or one of its entities is going to close more funding rounds on the African continent. And it's pretty simple. Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, founder of Blue Origin. As you know, there's a space race going on as well. And founder of several other organizations and an investor is actually going to be more active on the African funding space. So what company, what industry is um, their organization going to invest in? Well, we'll see. And um, remember, as I said earlier, follow um, our page, media.getfundedafrica.com. Yes, you can see it scrolling down below. Um, follow the page and let's see if this prediction is going to come true. So there you have it. It's all about creating wealth and knowing how to create wealth. So if you're going to do anything, please remember, please, please, please remember, it's important for you to take what you earn, find a way to earn something, whether it's by buying or selling products, or even if you work in a company, you earn a salary, take some of that amount and actually invest in your future. Don't just consume everything. 
they will not consume everything. Um, there will always be bills to pay, school fees, clothes, and things like that, rent. There are always bills to pay. But if all you're doing is paying bills and then maybe buying certain things for yourself just to satisfy your feeling, what happens is that you are in a rat race. And that's going to continue over and over and over again, where, whereby you're literally chasing your own tail. So please, as I said, look for ways to save or look for ways to invest small amounts. It doesn't even matter what that amount is. As long as you begin that journey of saving or investing in things that create value and can create returns for you. So wishing you all the very, very best on your wealth journey. Remember to visit our website, getfundedafrica.com. We've got fantastic opportunities for you to enable your businesses or even enable your business ideas, whatever it is that, it, that you really want to do. Um, don't forget also to subscribe to Debo's Den on YouTube and also hit the notification button such that when um, new editions of Debo's Den comes out, you'll be notified. Thank you. Have a great week ahead.